to talk about friends. <laughs> okay, friends. It's, it's, it always seems like you're stuck in second gear when it hasn't been your day, your week, your life, or even your year. I'll be there for you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's like the, the Shatner version of the song Friends. So, um, But uh, yeah, Friends, it's a popular show. It was a popular show. I remember when it came out on the air and um, it was just a very, uh, uh, it was a different type of show. But Friends is something that we're, we're, we're used to on TV. There's always those friends that we've grown up watching. Name a couple famous friend groups that we've seen on TV growing up. Yes. Cheers. Cheers, okay. Yes. What's that? Partridge family. Yes. Come on, get happy. Okay. Oh. Mash. Okay. Hawkeye and Klinger. Yep. Okay. Let's go. Ba- let's dial it back a little further now. Laurel and Hardy. Okay. Andy Griffith and uh, what's that? Father knows best. There you go. Yep. We have uh, uh, Evan and Costello. Leave it to Beaver. Laverne and Shirley. And of course, we're going to say Laverne and Shirley. You got to say who? Lenny and Squiggy. Okay, <laughs> those guys. You know what's interesting? I was reading about this. That friends are a thing that works in movies. We've seen this over and over again. And now, now forgive me. I'm just pointing out the scientific fact that I read in e- e- Entertainment Weekly magazine. One is always the tall, skinny one, and one is the always what? Okay, just saying. Okay. <laughs> And so this is a duo that works, okay? And I mean, look at some of the more modern comedies. There was David Spade and Chris Farley, okay? One wasn't necessarily tall, but he was the skinny one, and one was a little more horizontal, uh, vertically challenged, okay? Um, and there, there was, uh, over and over again, we see this, and it even trickled o- over into one of the, the most famous series ever. And they pointed this out on on, the, on, on TV once in a documentary talking about dissecting this movie. It trickles over into Star Wars. Who are the two that bring comic relief? C-3PO and R2-D2, okay? <laughs> this is, it's, it's funny, but it's, all of a sudden you hit it, it's like, oh yeah, he's short and stubby, that's tall and skinny, <laughs> and they're always cracking jokes, you know? It's just kind of funny. So friends are an important part of life. And friends are something that's sung over and over. If you grew up in the church in the 80s and 90s, you heard inevitably the offertory. That's when churches would do offertory. Someone would sing while the offering was being taken. And someone inevitably would get up and sing Michael W. Smith's song. And friends are friends forever. You know, that song, if the Lord's the Lord of them. And then as you get older, you're like, oh, this song again. (laughs) Um, We were just at, uh, I, I was a judge for... Uh, the Assembly of God Fine Arts Festival. And uh, I was talking to some of the youth pastors, and I feel like a grandpa compared to these youth pastors. I'm like, really? You look like a kid. But I'm like, so what's the song all the kids are singing right now? That, you know, because back in the 90s and 80s, Beth, Brad, you remember these days, it was like over and over the kids would either sing Jackie Velasquez, I Get On My Knees, Beauty for Ashes, Crystal Lewis. And they're like, I don't know, just, I don't know, there, there really isn't a song anymore. But you know, regardless, it was always the solid one was friends. And that's because this word, this thought, this concept carries a lot of weight. And as you get older, that's all of us, as you get older, <clears throat> friends become more and more precious. I've said it over and over again that I think the least talked about, but one of the biggest miracles of Jesus was having 12 close friends in his 30s, okay? I think that was one of Jesus' biggest miracles because friends help us get through things, and that's where I want to hang out this morning for a little while. You see, when you spend time with, uh, with your friends, when you spend, time, when you spend your time with, with them, you'll have a great impact. They're going to have a great impact on what kind of life you live. It's just easy to say from little kids on. And if, if you uh, are hanging out with this somebody, the traits are going to rub off on each other. There are people that God has already placed to come across at your path in life. Okay, Friends that are going to be connected, friends that you're going to reconnect with. And if you're spending time with wrong people, here's the a, here's a truth. You're not going to meet the right ones. And so I want to talk about this a little bit. If you're hanging around people that are not going anywhere, places, people that are, are dragging you down, causing you to compromise, draining your energy, you're going to get stuck and I'm going to get stuck in these areas. 
We see it over again, over again in our youth groups. Um, it, it, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we always called it friendship evangelism. The, you would tell your youth pastor, I'm dating so-and-so. And the youth pastor inevitably would ask, is he or she a Christian? <laughs> well, I don't know. She, I guess she goes to the Catholic church once a year. You, you try to rationalize it a little bit because you're just more on the outward going, you know. And uh, so you start trying to rationalize these things. And, and, and what happens is we used to call it friendship evangelism. Inevitably, if it went the distance, and the distance in a youth group is one week, um, it would, <laughs> flavor of the day, um, it would, uh, did I say that? Can pastors say that? I don't know. But um, it was literally one of these things where, you know, it, it's sadly, but the, the, the Christian would get pulled down a little bit. The language would change, the attitude would change, uh, demeanor would change. And so you, you want to know what, where you're going to be like in five years. This is an old saying, who are your friends? If you want to know who you're going to be in five years, you got to look at your friend circle and see who your friends are. There's an old saying that parents of yesteryears would say it and parents today would say it. Show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. And this is a very important truth that rings true for adults, kids, everybody. You're not going to become who you're created to be by hanging out with the wrong crowd. You don't have to be rude, okay? You don't have to make some big announcement. You just little by little start distancing yourself and spending less time with them if they're pulling you down. I am a Christian. Therefore, Regina, we cannot be friends anymore. No, you don't do that kind of stuff. You know, you're still a friend to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be buddy-buddy if our paths go in different ways. I'm not going to compromise who I am and the trajectory God has me on in order to be pulled down and do these sort of things, and which would get me off track. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. You see, Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers him. Walk with the wise and you will become wise. I, I enjoy golfing. If I'm going out with a group of guys that are, that are just out to goof around and you know, not really play a, a solid game, my game's going to suffer. Okay, and their game's going to suffer. Likewise, if I'm teeing it up every time, like Billy Madison, okay, um, no, Happy Gilmore. If I tee it up every time like that and run up on the ball and try to hit it and stuff, we screw around the whole 18 holes, it's not going to be a good score. But if I go out and I play with somebody who's good, that wants to have fun, but wants a good score, my game is going to come up. Okay, that's just how it goes. And we'll talk about a law that that pertains to in a little bit. Proverbs chapter 20 uh, 2 verse 24 it says um, it says do not make friends with a hot-tempered person do not associate with one easily angered notice the principle in these verses whatever qualities your friends have either good or bad they're eventually going to rub off on us now I realize a message like this is something that we some usually would expect for kids to hear but I can promise you as adults and as a former youth pastor, we need to hear these things again. Because what I saw in youth ministry for 10 years is what we see in adult ministry as well. It's kind of like, well, you know, that, that, that talk should be for the youth group and stuff. Are you kidding me? The things I see happening with adults... <laughs> that, needs, that needs to be a talk for this as well. Almost like, it's almost like we need to have true love waits for, for adults. Oh, I went there. Okay. But anyways, <laughs> whatever qualities your friends have, either good or bad, they're eventually going to rub, rub off on you. Let me get a little more Pentecostal up in here. Spirits are transferable. Okay? Spirits are transferable. In fact, I would use the word contagious. If I get around a bunch of negative people, guess who's going to become negative as well? And I, I'm very easy at doing that. I had a friend that went into, went into missions, and they uh, were having a great time, but all of a sudden, things went, things went south on them. 
uh, giving wasn't there. The people at the at the office was giving them a hard time. And I didn't even know who this person was, but they're telling me all about it. And I'm like, yeah, he's a jerk. You know, that's sort of, how can they do that and everything? And that's just who I am. If you need somebody in your corner, you, I'm your guy. Okay, that's just how I am. I, I, I relate very well to Peter or Abishai in the scriptures. Like, I don't know what I'm screaming about, but I'll scream for you. Okay, <laughs> that's just who I am. But, you know, spirits are transferable. If you hang out with a gossip before, before long, guess what you're going to be? A gossip. If you hang out with somebody really positive and optimistic, guess what you're going to become? Positive and optimistic. You hang around with people that compromise, run around with their, on their spouse before long, that starts becoming a thought in your mind as well. However, if you hang around with excellent people, excellence will rub off on you. If, you, if you're an up-and-coming entrepreneur and you hang out with somebody who isn't, there's not a lot of dreaming and motivation going on. Not saying either one is bad, but if you're wanting to be an entrepreneur, you need to hang out with somebody else who has that pioneering spirit in them and is wanting to go after it. And they'll teach you and show you ways and give you things um, you know, it, that, that are going to get you going on the right path. If you associate with successful people, people that are determined, motivated, going places, the same good qualities will become part of your life. And so in the realm of friends, and we've seen it with Ross, and what are the other friends' names? Rachel. Rachel. Okay, I'm surprised a guy didn't say that, actually. Okay. <laughs> Phoebe, yes, the cat lady that sings about the cats and stuff at the Chandler. daily. Chandler, yep. So you start hey, you, all of them. I promise you, when you watch those movies over those TV shows over and over again, you're gonna see that they have set boundaries. Okay, that these people set boundaries. Abbott and Costello. Every year when my son starts playing baseball, I make him watch the the, the, the Abbott and Costello clip. Who's on first? <laughs> okay. And <laughs> the, the guy that's the smaller one, is that Lou Abbott? Lou, Lou Costello? That's Lou Costello, the shorter guy. He gets so revved up, okay? He, he, he reminds me of the guy from American Pickers, the, uh, Frank, okay? <laughs> just gets so revved up and that he's trying to figure this out. And if he would just have said, no, I'm done, done. I'm not doing this anymore. The, the skit wouldn't have been what it was, but it would have been a boundary set up saying, you're not, no, you're not getting in my head again. Okay, I, I, don't, need, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> and it would have just gone a whole different way. But over and over again, we see in our own lives, we have to have boundaries. You hear somebody that's always negative, critical, finding fault. If you, don't know, if you haven't seen somebody do this before, sit and people watch at the Fox River Mall. It's amazing if you see one lady walk by, and then you'll see probably two or three others, probably younger ones, walking behind them doing this thing. Oh, really? That's how they look? That's how they're dressed? You know? and, or you can see people that are sitting on the bench, and they're just pointing out everything about other people. In youth ministry, you would have the kid that was pointing out everything. And, and, and I oftentimes said this, you show me the kid that's pointing out the flaws in everybody else, and I'm gonna show you one very insecure child, okay? Because that comes from a spirit of insecurity. If we're going to throw people under the bus constantly, if we come and serve on the rock, with the rock, and we point out in the car ride home, wow, that person should get that person, that person, it, it points back at us at our own insecurities. And so, it's a red flag if, if that somebody is always doing these things. You can still be kind and friendly to these, per, these people, but we shouldn't spend a lot of time with a friend that's going to do that over and over again. Be selective. And I realize sometimes at, our, at home or work, we don't have a choice of who we're around. I get that. I totally get that. I'm around the pastor at this church all the time. He's a jerk. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you don't have a choice, so you make it work. You, but then you set up mental boundaries. Okay, so you're around negativity all day at work. What are you doing on the way home to set your mind, as Scripture says, on things above? 
Are you going to listen to a, 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 a motivational, a, a edifying, a, a preaching, a podcast on the way home in your car? Are you going to just leave the radio off and just say, God, help me, fill my mind with new things? Maybe you'll kick on the family and listen to some good uh, positive music. I don't know. But whatever it is we do to get out of that slump, God will give us the grace for those situations where you don't have a choice. But I'm talking about when you do have a choice. You see, life's too short to waste valuable time with the wrong people. This is the number one thing that I see pe that gets people off course is running with the wrong crowd. A year ago, two years ago, you're like, what happened? You were this person. You were a joy to be around. You started going with this crowd, and this is like your lifestyle now. What happened? As a Christian that's been a Christian for 36 years and grew up in the youth ministries and all that, I will say this. I believe wholeheartedly in the power of Jesus Christ and the transformation power that he has in our life. However, I've seen it over and over again, and it's very rare it doesn't go this way. You take somebody who's solid in their faith and they start running with the wrong crowd, they will get pulled down. That's the power of sin. That's the power of negativity. That's life. So we have to be careful with who we go with. People ask me often, well, doctors, especially nurses, do you drink? No, I don't drink. They almost look at you nowadays like, really? <laughs> it says here you got three kids. You don't drink? <laughs> no, I don't. There's, there's three reasons. Number one, I was raised not to. It wasn't in our home. That's just how it was. We were raised in an assembly got home. My mom didn't even go to movies, okay, and she cringed at playing cards. Okay, that's the home that we were raised in. Beth can give me an amen on that. <laughs> and then there's also um, the taste. I just, I can't do the alcohol taste. I've tried it, I've tasted it, and I've seen. It's not good, okay? <laughs> Number three, I have a very addictive personality. Whatever I sink my teeth into, I go all in on. Okay, mountain biking, I'm all in. Look at my car, stickers, mountain biking. Um, hobbies, things like that. If I do something, I'm all in. And honestly, this is where I resonate with the Apostle Paul, and this is where transparency can be a good thing in church. If I enjoyed it, I would go down a dark path. How's that for transparency from a pastor? Amen. So that's why I don't even try it. Because there is a part of me that scares me that says, I might actually like the taste of it. And I do deal with stresses, and I do deal with kids and all this stuff, and I don't want to go down that path. I had a Christian artist in at our church back in Milwaukee, and we were talking about transparency in my home, and he was a well-known Christian uh, artist. He was known for pioneering a lot of the Christian uh, music in the earlier days, and, and he sat and we were sitting there, and he goes, so what's your weakness? We talked, and I said, so what's your weakness? He goes, and he came from a dark past. He says, if you drew a line of Coke in front of me, I'd snort it. I love that. I love that we can have that transparency in our, in our walk with Christ. He came out of that lifestyle of Coke and everything else, and he knew his boundaries. He says, if, you drew, if somebody drew that in front of me, I would probably snort it. And that's why he doesn't hang out with that crowd. Because it's, it's a friend circle he just doesn't want to be around. And I resonate with that because if I try something and I, and I like it, I don't know where that would go in my own life. So I hang out with a different group of friends. Whoa, pastor just got transparent. <laughs> we need that in churches. We need that blatant honesty in churches. This is the number one thing that I see that gets people off courses, off their course. I read once, and I'm, I'm going to read this. I read where Thomas Edison, Harry Firestone, and Henry Ford, sound like familiar names, had summer homes next door to each other in Florida. They were friends and would spend much of the summers together. You notice they did not, they, you'll notice they didn't just associate with anyone. They associated with other dreamers, with other people of vision, and no wonder they soared to new heights because that was their friendship circle. Wow, C.S. Lewis was a good author. Yeah. 
because he hung out with a group called the Inklings in a little tavern with J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and all of these other authors. That was their friendship circle. And so you get these guys together, oh, they're gonna have a fun time and whoop it up. But this is why such phenomenal writing came out of that circle of friends, the Inklings. Google them, it's, a, it's an interesting group of friends. See, Proverbs 28, seven says, young people who obey the law are wise. Those with wild friends bring shame to their parents. So the question is, are you hanging out with worthless companions? Now, let me backtrack on that word worthless. I don't mean, of course, that people are worthless. That's not what we're about. But they're not adding value to your life, okay? These are people I would have no problem serving. These are people I have no problem helping. These are people I would have no problem sitting at a parade with or something. But to hang out as iron sharpens iron, no. That's my boundary. I need someone I can laugh with. I need somebody that I can build up, somebody that, they can, that I can be built up off of them. And that's why scripture has that verse. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Or lady. They're not inspiring you to reach your dreams and they're dragging you down. You need to reassess. I believe if you let go of the wrong people, God will bring the right people into your life. He knows we want friends. He created us. We're hardwired for companionship. As one person said, don't settle for a chicken. God has an eagle. <laughs> what does an eagle do when he wants to get away from all the hustle and bustle? This is scientific. Watch PBS, watch Discovery, watch anything. If you know anything about eagles, if a crow's bothering him, what does an eagle do? Go up. He goes up to heights that other birds can't go. And so if you're, gonna, if you're getting pecked at, you're getting brought down, you're getting all these things, leave the crow. <laughs> leave the chicken. Get up to new heights. Why does scripture use over and over again the imagery of eagles? Because they're majestic, they soar, they can go and they reach heights that other, other birds just can't. And they do it effortlessly. Have you ever seen an eagle? Go drive around today, you will see one. They just go up and ride the, the, the wind and they go up and up and just hardly flap a, have, flap a wing. Crows and the little birds, I always say the little, the little ones with the Napoleon syndrome, okay, they have something to prove. They're flapping like crazy, they're pecking, they're balking, they're doing all sorts of things. Eagles are like, see ya, I'm up. <laughs> he wants us to soar. A blessing is always attached to obedience when we're a Christian. But too many people are stuck. The sooner we make these changes, the better off we're going to be. We ought not to spend valuable time with people that bring out the worst in us. If your friends are causing you to compromise, that's a sign that you're probably with the wrong group. If you love your spouse, you start hanging out with another group and all of a sudden you're looking at your spouse like, I don't know. They're calling you to question. You need to seriously reconsider your friend group. People will stir up your greatness. People that will inspire you to rise to a new height. We see in Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 it says, now, now Daniel so distinguished himself. Let's stop right there. It doesn't say God distinguished Daniel. It says Daniel so distinguished himself. In other words, Daniel is a Christian at this point, but he knows who he is. He knows who he, who, who, he knows himself. He knows who the Christ in him. And he had three other friends that helped him out along the way. We'll talk about that. But he says Daniel distinguished himself among the administrators and the uh, satraps by the exceptional qualities at the king, that the king planted to set high over the kingdom. In other words, Daniel knew who he was, and so he walked in that confidence. And then he also had three other friends. If you study his life, you'll, you'll find who his excellent friends were. You know who Daniel hung out with? It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these are three people that knew who Christ was. They've experienced him in his life. And these are the friends that Daniel had to bring up his own life. So no wonder Daniel was a person of excellence. His friends were people of integrity. They were people of courage. 
people that would not compromise, that was evident. And there are people that had a big dream for their life. So no wonder Daniel distinguished himself because it wasn't a second thought on who he knew he was. He walked in that. See, psychologists, this is what I wanted to get to, um, they, it, um, oh, I guess, okay, we can cancel off of that. One of my slides got deleted. But on your outline, it says, psychologists tell us there's something called the law of the group. That is, we associate with people the way we see ourselves. Okay? This is interesting. Have you noticed how people that like to gossip find other people that like to gossip? Negative people gravitate towards negative people. Complainers find other complainers. Thus, the Bible says, thus there's a saying, not the Bible, but there's a saying, birds of a feather flock together. And so I would encourage us this morning is to make sure that we're flocking to the right group. Everybody needs Christ, and as a church, we need to understand that. As a pastor, I understand that. But I'm going to be blatantly honest with you. When I see someone struggling with alcoholism, and they end up going to a bar to find counsel from one of their friends that's there, I cringe a little bit. When somebody is struggling in their marriage, and they're going to go get advice from somebody who just divorced, I cringe a whole lot. I'm going to say something very bold but very true for this city. Divorce is contagious. It's a cancer in our city. The last couple of years in this city and in our church has been awful. And I sit back and I'm like, if, if we don't understand that spirits are transferable, we need to open our eyes and relook at things and what's going on. We need to reassess who the friends are. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There are reasons, there are biblical reasons that Paul lays out for divorce. I get that. I totally get that. But these things are, are contagious. I've seen it happen back in 2008, 2009. A group here, you know, one got divorced and all of a sudden it's just like boom, 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 back to back. I was like, you got to see, even if you're not a Christian, you got to see that this thing is contagious. And so... I would just encourage you to make sure you're flocking to the right group. Victorious people associate with victorious people. Successful people find other successful people. Find friends that are going to make something out of their life. Let me add this. There are times that you can outgrow a friend. Okay? God had them in your life for a season. You blessed them. They blessed you. But now that season's over. But you know you can't spend the same amount of time and become who you were created to be. True friends are going to understand this. And there will come a point, perhaps, when they're going to come back full circle and you, and you join up again. I'm finding that in my own life right now. I don't know if he's watching right now or not, but my friend Mario, his dad owns Bellisteri's Pizza. <clears throat> we, we were gone for a long time. We reconnected because he offered the dinner at his restaurant for my mom's funeral. And now this week I'm doing his wedding. We just see these things coming back together again. Sometimes friends, they fall apart because you're going places they can't go. And likewise. <clears throat> but perhaps God brings us back together again down the road when life kicks you in the rear end a little more. <laughs> And you realize what's truly important. True friends won't try to make you feel guilty. They'll be happy for you. They'll celebrate where you're going. Just as God opens doors, he closes doors. And you can't get stuck trying to hold on to something that's over and done. And I know we don't like change, but that's the way it goes. So I would just encourage you this morning, reassess your friends. I would say this with kids too. Reassess your friends. Because as the old saying goes, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. It's an important thought. Friends are everything. <clears throat>